Hello, I'm Marty Moss Cohen. Welcome to Radio Times on TV. Coming up, remembering the late great folk singer Steve Goodman, who used to be a regular at the Philadelphia Folk Festival. The Philadelphia Folk Festival at the Old Pool Farm is a long standing tradition. One of the popular performers used to be Steve Goodman. The audiences loved his infectious style, his warm voice, his humor, and his smart lyrics. Goodman died a number of years ago at the age of 36 after battling leukemia for 16 years. Clay Eels is a big fan and he's written a new book called Steve Goodman Facing the Music. Eels was our guest on the show when he was in for this month's folk festival. Well, you wrote a great big book here. I understand it took you eight years. You interviewed something like a thousand people and it's more than 700 pages. Uh, yeah, it's exactly <laughs> 800 pages. It's got 547 photos. It's got 400,000 words. I actually had a guy tell me recently, uh, most people most people want to write a book that you can't put down, but you've written a book that you, you can't, can't pick, pick up. up. <laughs> right. But you're a fan, right? A fan from the get-go? Oh, sure, sure. I had his albums in the 70s. Um, I got to see him perform twice. Uh, I wooed my wife with his songs. Did I you? sent her tapes. Uh, he was just the best. He, he ruined me for any other performer. <laughs> and the best Goodman, of course, was Live Goodman. Was Live Goodman. Yeah. Because why? Oh, well, he, you know, you, you, you think of other musicians and they're known for their songwriting or for their singing or for their guitar playing. But what he really wanted to do is to take those three elements and put them all together and be the best entertainer possible. And I think that's really one of the lessons of his life is to, is to do your best in the moment. Right. I mean, he, anybody who saw him, and there, there were so many people who got to see him perform, uh, just came away galvanized. They, and, and it didn't take long. Steve Martin, for instance, told me it took, he, he said he'd come out and when the red, red robin comes bob, bob, bobbing along, in 30 seconds he'd have him. He'd have the, the audience with him. Yeah, and we're talking an audience of 10 15,000 sure, sure. people, you know. Well, you write a bit about his growing up, and it's always interesting to sort of see where somebody came from, grew up in a, in a Jewish family, mm -hmm. and had a beautiful voice as a young kid, would sing in synagogue. And well, people would just, as you write, would just get real quiet when he sang. Well, he, he, he came by his uh, practice at, at performing for an audience very early. He was, he was the star temple singer. And, <laughs> and you got to go back. You realize this is the late 50s, early 60s. This is the baby boom. And Saturday mornings, sometimes the bar mitzvahs would be stacked up, you know, one or two or three, and he would be the one that people came to see. Of course, people came to s for the bar mitzvahs. Sure. But when he uh, came down the aisle to the front of the choir loft, this little guy, they had to lower the microphone for him, um, and with this trained voice uh, singing uh, these Hebrew songs, uh, just just... Three or four hundred people. I mean, imagine you're eight years old and you're singing for three or four hundred people. That's a good place to learn how to perform. <laughs> but but didn't come from what looked like, at least on the outside, a particularly musical family. I mean, there wasn't no. there weren't instruments all over the house, oh, for instance. Good, <laughs> Goodman said um, my my parents had a record player. My dad played Harry Belafonte. My dad played you know, <laughs> <laughs> no no instruments. He, his mom played piano, but he didn't find out about it right. until he was an adult. Right. So, right. He, his real inspiration, I mean, certainly temple music, but, but he was a kid who was interested in the radio, just like all of us were, um, you know. And, and Chicago was a particularly rich place to grow up in that area. You spin the dial and you got rock, you got pop, you got country, blues, and he loved to do that. Mm. And he was, he, he was a sponge. Uh, and, and one person told me, I love this, that, that he had a phonographic memory. In other words... So he could recreate something that he had just heard. Yes, yes. And his parents wanted him to be a doctor, you know, but music was really what was in his veins. And we know we, we began with, uh, I guess, his most famous song, City of, of oh, New of course, Orleans. And, of and we heard him singing his own song. And I'd actually love to play another version of it. And this is Arlo Guthrie's version of City of New Orleans. Uh, first of all, just give us the, the short, I guess, story of how he wrote this, how he came to write this song. A City of New Orleans? Yeah. Um, he, in, after high school, he rode the train itself uh, to and from uh, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana from Chicago. One day, he, he skipped his classes and went all the way down to New Orleans and came back. And that's where the really the core of the mm -hmm. chorus came Okay, fast forward five years later, and he took a ride on the train with his wife to go get introduced to his uh, uh, wife's grandmother in Mattoon, 
and uh, then he wrote the rest of the song, or at least what he thought was the rest of the song. He wrote what we know as the first and third verses. Came back to Chicago, Earl of Old Town, legendary club, played it for a musician there, and this musician, Richard Wedler, said, well, that's great. A lot of people write train songs, right. but, but uh, um, why don't you do a Steinbeck and tell what happened inside the train? And so the images that really are visceral that we know the most from that song, you know, the, the, the babies rocking in their mother's arms and the paper bag that holds the bottle, that came out from that instigation, and then he had the whole song. Well, let's listen, and this is Arlo Guthrie's version of City of New Orleans. Riding on the city of New Orleans Illinois Central, Monday morning rail Fifteen cars and fifteen restless riders Three conductors, twenty-five sacks of mail All along the southbound Odyssey Train pulls out at Kankakee and rolls along past houses, farms, and fields. Passing trains that have no name, and freight yards full of old black men, and the graveyards of the rusted automobiles. Good morning. That, of course, is uh, Arlo Guthrie, his version of a Steve Goodman song, City of New Orleans. Steve Goodman was a little guy. He was short. He's five foot two. A guy isn't supposed to be five two. No. <laughs> I mean, but he, that never seemed to hold him back or, no, or, no, no. or become a problem for him. He, he, he just had this buoyant personality from the time he was very young. And as you alluded to earlier, um, he, he was diagnosed with leukemia when he was 20. And one of the things... <clears throat> that I was trying to do in researching his life was to to get at his his persona before the diagnosis. And this was a driven, uh, just a, 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 a uh, ebullient yes. guy from the word go. And people gravitated to him. He just had this charisma. And so his height really didn't get in the way. Although it, it he, he didn't get many dates. He was, Is that right? He was sort of like the little brother to a lot of people, uh, a, lo- a lot of uh, girls he might like to have taken out. Uh, um, but, uh, but he was just, I mean, if you go to the dictionary and look up the word gregarious, you'd find Steve Goodman. Just because that was what his personality was like. A little guy, though, with, I'm assuming, little hands? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the one one source told me that his fingers were like little Vienna hot dogs, and how in the world that he were, was able to reach around the guitar neck and get uh, to the right frets all the time was a major miracle. Um, and uh, but but he just did it. He f- he forced himself. Uh, uh, he started learning guitar in his, his high school years, mm-hmm. and the and the classmates who taught him guitar. It was both an endearing but a frustrating experience for them because they'd teach him something and then he'd shoot ahead of them just right away. He was just born to the instrument and to the whole world of music. And, and I've interviewed uh, folk singers of this era and they talk about you know being 14, 15, 16 years old and spending just hours and hours and days and days on end playing, practicing, playing, practicing, just noodling on their guitar. That's what he would do. Um, one uh, friend of his from high school, a, a girl, a woman now, a gr- but a girl then who was in a, a, a trio uh, in high school, said that um, when you're talking with him, when you're in his presence, he would have his con- guitar with him constantly, mm-hmm. and he would constantly, like you say, be playing, and it sounded like angel music, mm. this tinkling in the background, and, he'd, and, and you'd be talking about some other topic, and then he'd say, wait a minute, listen to this. What do you think of this? How does this sound? And then he'd go back to the conversation. It was just always in his uh, in his presence. You mentioned his leukemia, and he was yeah. diagnosed uh, at a very young age, at, at the age of 20, with leukemia. Mm-hmm. Do you know how he, how he came to be diagnosed, or what the symptoms were, or 
Oh, well, why you he know, went to the doctor that day? There are many, many symptoms. You know, back in back in the day, as you say, yeah. um, one of the huge symptoms is uh, severe fatigue, and uh, you. In, when we were in college then, people would th- say, oh, you've got mono, go exactly. to the doctor. Um, and and that's curable, you know. Um, he was going to Lake Forest College in Illinois, and he was sort of burning both candles. He was going to classes during the day as much as he could, but he was also making a name for himself at the Earl of Old Town late at night. In fact, there was a newspaper clip uh, I found uh, that, that wondered how in the heck he was doing both things at once. And people just assumed that he was wearing himself out. But uh, when he went to the doctor, um, he found out that it was much more serious than that. And he lived with leukemia, what, for 16 years? Yeah. Now, you've got to take into account the year. This is 1969 when he was diagnosed. This was the dark ages of leukemia treatment. It was basically a death sentence. Uh, Love Story, you know, the book and the movie. uh, Ally McGraw didn't last very long. Mm. And and the, the... he wasn't supposed to last but a few months if, hmm. or a year. Let me get to Micah from Portland, Maine to join us. Hi, Micah. Go ahead. You're on Radio Times. Hi. I'm calling because um, I used to do a radio show myself, nothing like yours, but for 10 years I was on Maine Public Radio interviewing oh, cool. singer-songwriters and have a lot of friends in the, in the business. And I was a huge fan of Steve Goodman, always was, never had the chance to see him, never had a chance to... Uh, um, to interview him. Um, he was gone before my show started. I wrote reviews about him and heard a lot about him from all sorts of singer-songwriters. I've interviewed hundreds. And one of the things that I've found about him that's amazing is that he could do anything. He could do covers perfectly. He could write his own stuff, serious stuff, perfectly, and perform it perfectly. He could write funny stuff perfectly. But I think the most amazing thing I've heard is we all know how people talk, and I've got to know a number of singer-songwriters, as I'm sure you have, Marty, and sure. I have never heard a bad thing about him, and I can't say that about anybody else. Nobody has ever said anything negative about him, and it's just amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm well, not that I want to know anything bad about him. I'm a huge fan, but I'm wondering if you found the same thing in doing the biography. Well, that's an interesting question, and, and I have to say, um, having uh, read through Clay Eels's book, and, and you've got one wonderful thing that one that that a singer that that Arlo Guthrie or anybody says about C. Goodman and you do wonder did anyone not like this guy did he take well, off anybody <laughs> Go no ahead, well you know that's that's why the book is so big in part um, there are many voices in this book and it's sort of a journalist's uh, blessing and nightmare all in one when you get to the end of an interview and they say well uh, don't just talk to me but you got to talk to X Y and Z and that's fine but it just fans out like a mm. like a chain letter this is not a hagiography, though. This guy was not a saint. Um, uh, there are real difficult parts of the book and difficult parts of his life, but certainly his public persona. And I'm not trying to say he was different privately. That right. was one thing people said quite a bit, was that he was the same off stage as he was on stage. But people revered him. People loved him. I mean, think about it. Uh, this process, I've been doing, I, I worked on this for eight years, and um, Think of somebody in your own life whom you were, you, you, who really affected you 20, 30 years ago, but um, you haven't thought about them. Your, your paths have diverged. And then some guy comes up and says, I'm doing a book about this guy. Some people cried. I mean, he affected people so deeply, mm. so viscerally. He did, uh, and Micah, thanks for the call to Radio Times. He did have disputes, though, with John Denver. I mean, I'm thinking, and not, not to get, I and mean, there's nothing particularly salacious in here, but it's not as if it was all. Well, this was a tough guy. Kumbaya, and, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, you know, the John Denver story, very briefly, is that John Denver um, bodlerized uh, mm-hmm. City of New Orleans, sort of turned it into City of New Orleans light. And Goodman, you got to realize this was before Arlo's version made it ubiquitous and uh denver you know this was a chance before he died perhaps to get a hit song through somebody who had just swept the nation with take me home country roads but goodman was irate not just at what denver did to the song but then he claimed half the songwriting credit for it on his album whew Arlo read him the riot act, basically. Yeah, I mean, did, did <laughs> set him straight? Did set Steve, John Denver straight. Did Steve Goodman ever forgive John Denver? Oh, sure, sure. Um, they, there's there's a great uh, incident where he's just livid uh, backstage at a at a radio uh, showcase here in Philadelphia. That's oh, right. Um, and uh, 
and he goes to talk to the guy, and then somebody asks him afterward, did you get it worked out? And, Good- and Goodman says, well, you know, I can't stay mad at the guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Micah, thanks for the call to Radio Times. Let me get Zeldine from uh, Roxborough to join us. Hi, Zeldine. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hi. Hi there. Um, uh, my, son, my son's name was Steve Bird. He was uh, um, uh, Steve Goodman was the best man at his wedding. Oh, my goodness. And um, I met uh, Steve Goodman the first time at a concert, believe it or not, Burlington County High School. This oh, yeah. is how far back that goes. <laughs> and um, I was just stunned at, after the performance, meeting him, that he was small. I mean, he was just so big on the stage. Well, you know, Zeldine, I have to say and, that, that Clay Eels just passed me his book, which I'm barely holding up here, and there's a photo of your son, Steve Berg, Shown in 1973 while backing Steve Goodman at the Philadelphia Folk Festival. Either your son is really tall or Steve Goodman is really short. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, um, Steve was interviewed by, I guess, by Clay and uh, met a whole lot of people, got reattached to a lot of people that he knew in the past. And unfortunately, my son died about two and a half years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. Steve's dead now. I tell you, um, it was a really a gift to spend time with your son. Oh, thanks. And, and, you know, a project like this doesn't happen overnight. And there have been several people who have died since I interviewed them, but before the book came out. And I have to believe it's a Goodman life lesson that you live in the moment. And I have to believe that, that everybody I interviewed um, had to feel, whether they knew that their life was short or not, that that what they were doing in the moment was valuable and would have some value in and of itself, regardless of whether they actually ever got to see Mm -hmm. the book. You know, and some people say, I mean, most people who start a book rarely finish it. You know, it's a, and, and this took a long time. A lot of people were very patient with me. And I'm sorry that Steve was not able to see the book, Mm. but, but I knew that he knew from my communication with him, I knew that he knew that he was really glad that it was in the works, and and I and he oh, knew yeah. it was going to happen. And and Zeldina, it's a it's a great picture, and I hope you have a chance to look at it. And I do want to play uh, another cut, and this is uh, a song called "Mama Don't Allow," and it's Steve Goodman and a whole group of people playing. Let's listen. Mama don't allow no music playing in here. Okay. <laughs> playing in here Mama don't allow no music playing in here We don't care what Mama don't allow We're gonna play some music anyhow Mama don't allow no music playing in here Now my mama don't allow no mandolin picking in here Mama don't allow no mandolin picking right here I don't care what Mama don't allow Jethro play that mandolin anyhow Mama don't allow no mandolin picking in here. Go on now. And another performance by Steve Goodman and Friends, a song called Mama Don't Allow. And I wanted to play that just because uh, Steve Goodman played with so many different people in his career. Yes, and uh, you all probably remember the phrase, don't trust anyone over 30. Well, Goodman was just the opposite. I mean, you heard Carl Martin singing there, and he's referring to Jethro Burns on the mandolin. These were people a generation older than Steve. He revered the music of the previous generations instead of rejecting it, and he incorporated it into his acts, which is why what, what made him what he called himself the hectic eclectic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a wonderful example of that. Well, you know, I in your book I ran across pictures and I had to look twice because here's a picture of Steve Goodman, John Prine, and Paul Anka. Well, all together in one frame. What Paul, was that about? Paul Anka was uh, the the previous generation to Goodman in terms of being a teen idol in the 50s. You know, Diana, put your head on my shoulder. 
And he, by the time that Goodman uh, had connected with him in 1971, had already gone Vegas. He'd written, um, you know, My Way for Frank Sinatra and the Tonight Show theme. And he happened to be in Chicago at the same time as Chris Christopherson. Chris Christopherson was the main act, and Goodman was the opening act. Anka was elsewhere. Anka came to see Christopherson, wanted to thank him for the song Help Me Make It Through the Night, invited this whole entourage out for a very late, early morning breakfast. Um, uh, Goodman played one song for Anka, Would You Like to Learn to Dance? Hmm. Anka says, you want a plane ticket to New York? And think of what would 99 percent of people would would do you know this means a recording contract all of the you know all of what you're dreaming of 99 percent of us would say gosh mr anka thank you very much you know what goodman said what he said if you think i'm good you got to come hear my friend john prine and this whole group the next night went to hear prine and anka shelled out two plane tickets to new york and we might not know about john prine if not for steve goodman Hmm. it's the, the ultimate act of generosity and the grand irony is that prine in any way that you measure success um, became more successful than goodman he sold more records he was kind of sold as the new dylan he had this kind of brooding uh image to him um goodman and prine were often double billed um i noticed that but goodman always opened and prine was the headliner oh, interesting. so goodman sent his friend into a place that Goodman himself never got. Let me play another um, Steve Goodman song. This is um, one that he wrote and also performed. And I think w- let's talk about it after we listen to it because it's um, it in many ways speaks for itself. And it's called "My Old Man." <laughs> I miss my old man tonight And I wish he was here with me With his corny jokes And his cheap cigars He could look you in the eye And sell you a car That's not an easy thing to do But no one ever knew A more charming creature On this earth Than my old man He was a pilot in the big war in the u.s army air corps in a c-47 with a heavy load full of combat cargo for the burma road and after they dropped the bomb He came home and married mom And not long after that He was my old man Um, It's just such a moving song And um, one of the things, I mean there's several things I love about it One is the simple lyrics and what you hear in his voice And, of course, the story of his old man, his dad. You know, people cry at this song, and um, it's it's an irony there. He's painting word pictures that you can see, and it's very specific about his dad. You know, car salesman, big war, all of that stuff. But the irony is that when you get specific as a writer, it becomes universal. Everybody can identify with it because they can see it. And And feel it. And feel it vis- I, I mean, this is this was the magic of Goodman's song crafting. Very mm-hmm. down to earth and very specific pictures that you can see. And uh, this obviously is about his dad who died at age fifty eight and he, he his dad wasn't supposed to die before Steve himself. This mm-hmm. was a huge shock. It fell to Steve to organize the memorial service for him. And what an unusual memorial service. All these people packed into a funeral parlor in Chicago, 
and there's a blank or an empty chair up front with a guitar, and the whole memorial service is Steve walking up to the front, picking up the guitar and saying, "This was my dad's favorite song." Wow! And he played the Dutchman, wow. set the guitar down, walked out. And that was the funeral. Well, you know, l- let me play another song, then I do want to get back to our callers. And um, this is called When My Rowboat Comes In. And again, I'm just looking at the clock here and just, I guess, the short version of where this song comes from. Goodman had in several songs the symbol of the sun and how he was not able to race with the sun because of his leukemia. The, in this song, he made peace with the sun. He made peace with his mortality. When the sun comes out, it'll be all right in the morning. This is not a very well-known Goodman song, but I chose to end the book with it because I just felt it really brought us in a, in a very gentle way to the end of his life. Let's listen. On the stormy night when the clouds roll in Hide the lucky stars that I am under And the smoky sky makes the heavens cry When the lightning strikes so long before the thunder When the rain is done and I'm all alone In the silence of the dawn that follows after Then I need Someone who can find the sun And chase away my sorrow with her laughter When my rowboat comes in There'll be room enough to ride Though the seas are rough In the highest tide When the sun comes out On the other side Everything will be all That's uh, When My Rowboat Comes In, uh, sung and written by Steve Goodman. Let me get uh, Joe from Clinton, New Jersey, to join us. Joe, go ahead, your Radio Times. Hi, Marty. Hi I'm a longtime listener and never call. Well, I'm glad but, you did. Uh, I wanted to call to say thank you to, to Mr. Eels for the, for the book. I just bought it. And Steve, I met Steve while he was going through chemotherapy. Wow. And, this was at uh, Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center? We. Well, uh, he used to stay at my house um, along with others in New York to recover. And Paula Ballin sent him to me, uh, who was one of his uh, great supporters in the early days uh, through the Philly Folk Festival. Yeah, and so, and, he, no, go ahead, Joe. Well, he, you know, he would sleep all day recovering from dreadful chemo. And then when I got home from work, he'd want to play. <laughs> and he'd keep me up all night remembering. He knew every 1950s rock and roll song, um, all the words, all the chords, uh, you know, just, just deep memory for music. And he was always a pleasure to be with. Well, Joe, it, it's a great call. And, and I'm watching the clock here because we're almost out of time and, and probably a, a very nice way to end the show. Thanks for calling into Radio Times. Thank you both. You're welcome. And uh, any final thoughts, uh, Clay? I do want to play one more song, not written by, but performed by Steve Goodman. I think the final thought is that uh, the the finality of our lives. I mean, there's a richness in Goodman's life to explore because he, like so many of us, uh, unlike so many Mm -hmm. of us, didn't take life for granted, could not take life for granted. Um, (laughs) His, his one of his final lyrics is so eloquent on this you know get it while you can if you mm-hmm. wait too long it'll all be gone and you'll be sorry then doesn't matter if you're rich or poor it's the same for a woman or a man from the cradle to the crypt it's a mighty short trip so you better get it while you mm-hmm. can let's end with that yeah well I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us today on Radio Times thank you Marty Radio Times airs live weekday mornings from 10 to 12 on WHYY 91 FM. For more information about the program, go to whyy.org slash Radio Times.